All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Princeton University's first public lecture for the season. My name is Anu Ramaswamy, and I'm the faculty chair of Princeton University's public lecture committee. I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering, the Environmental Institute, and the Sanjay Swani Professor of India Studies, where I direct Princeton's Center for Global India at our Institute for International and Regional Studies. So today, I am delighted to welcome all of you, along with our guest speaker, Professor Daron Achimolu, to this evening's event, Power and Progress, Our Thousand-Year Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity. Introducing uh, Professor Achimolu this evening is Atif Mia. He is the John H. Laporte Jr. Class of 1967, prof Professor of Economics and Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. He is also the director of the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. He holds a bachelor's degree in mathematics with computer science and PhD in economics from MIT. Prior to joining Princeton in 2012, Atif taught at the University of California, Berkeley and the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. Professor Mian's work studies the connections between finance and the macroeconomy. His latest book, House of Debt, with Amir Sufi, builds upon powerful new data to describe how debt precipitated the Great Recession. The book explains why debt continues to threaten the global economy and what needs to be done to fix the financial system. Before I turn the podium over to Professor Mian to introduce our speaker tonight, um, I'd like to let you know that this evening's event is sponsored by Princeton Public Lecture Stafford Little Lecture Series. The Stafford Little Lecture Series was founded in 1899 with a gift from Stafford Little of the class of 1844 for the purpose of supporting public lectures at the university to be given by former President Grover Cleveland. Following President Cleveland's death in 1908, funding has been used to bring other eminent intellectuals to the campus, and these include Albert Einstein, Thurgood Marshall, Jill Lepore, and Anita Hill, to name a few. Our co-sponsors this evening are Labyrinth Books, and uh, I hope all of you enjoy your copy uh, that you've received um, of Professor Achimolo's book. Um, uh, other sponsors um, include the Benjamin H. Griswold uh, Year of 33 Center for Economic Policy Studies, Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, FIA, uh, the Department of Economics, and the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. So on that note, I just wanted to remind everyone to take a minute to turn off your cell phones, and I'm going to hand it over to... Uh, Professor Mian to welcome our speaker. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Prof Professor Ramaswamy. It's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Daron Asimoglu, but it's an incredible job. Uh, I don't think if I try to do justice to this, I will take all of the time that is given to us. Uh, to go through all of the accomplishments and all the different ways he has impacted economics, political science, sociology, mathematics, computer science, you know, uh, the list goes on. And so um, I'll do nothing then. Uh, that's the other option I have. And, and, and just very briefly um, introduce Daron by saying he is one of the most influential uh, social scientists of this century. Um, He's incredibly prolific. Uh, you can Google him and you can look at the number of citations uh, that he has and continues to clock at breakneck speed. But I think what those citations really reflect is not only Daron's own genius, but the kind of impact, the breadth and the depth of his impact uh, that he has had on uh, the profession by influencing so many other uh, academics and scholars to write on questions and subjects that 
Daron raises with his uh, pen and his intellect. Um, it ranges from fields as diverse as growth and development to political economy, technological change, inequality, labor economics, economics of networks, and as I said, I could, I could go on. Uh, it's obviously no surprise at all, given this remarkable um, uh, uh, achievement, set of achievements that Daron has, that he has been given so many awards and many more to come, uh, including the award for the, for the best young economist, the Clark Medal. He is a member of multiple honor societies, including fellow of uh, National Academy of Science. He is the institute professor at MIT. Um, I will stop there because we all are here to listen to Daron. He is here to talk about his latest book, Power and Progress, 1,000 Year Struggle Over Technology and Prospect, which is co-written with Simon Johnson, one of his uh, collaborators. Uh, Daron also has five other books, uh, including the New York Times bestseller, Why Nations Fail. Um, Daron, welcome. And what we are going to do is we are going to have sort of a fireside chat, if you know there's no fire, we will have a chat nonetheless uh, to talk about the book and the ideas, and then we'll open up for questions and answers. Welcome, Daron. Thank you. So, Daron, let's just get started by you talking about why you wrote the book. Well, thanks, first of all, Atif, for those very kind words and for the invitation. It's just too loud. Uh, uh, it's, it's a true pleasure to be here, and thanks, everybody, for being here to listen to this. And let me briefly explain why Simon Johnson and I wrote this book. We did so because we believe we are at a critical period about the future of technology, inequality, and democracy, and we have very consequential choices about what that future will look like. This is true even before you factor in the new phase of advances that are taking place in generative AI. And in all of this, part of the motivation comes from the fact that we think the current landscape among public intellectuals, policymakers, and including some economists, is shaped by a type of techno-optimism that's not conducive to making the right choices. And according to this techno-optimistic view, technological progress, whatever shape it takes, will create inexorable powerful forces towards shared benefits. And hence, what we need to do is not worry too much and let the gales of progress work their way through the system. And if that's reality, we are on for a treat because there are indeed very consequential, impressive technological advances that are going on. But Simon and I argue in the book that there are several reasons for thinking that reality is more nuanced. There is no guarantee that technological progress will create the types of shared prosperity that we have sometimes experienced in the recent past. And this is doubly so under two types of effects from these technologies. One, when new technologies impact control of information. Information is critical for any type of political system and how you organize the economy. And we know from plenty of historical examples that when one group or one segment of society gets to monopolize information, that's not going to be conducive to the type of equality of opportunity, equality of voice. And you cannot have democratic citizenry when information is inaccurate or not shared. You cannot protect yourself against people abusing you, manipulating you when your information is not guarded and is open to abuse. So there are many reasons for worrying about technologies that are about control of information and digital tools in general, and many of the recent advances are in this domain. I think these issues are somewhat better understood today after the debacle of social media where we have experienced some of the abuses of information. But its implications for 
the next phase of technological progress and how we should make choices about the future of technology may still need to be worked out. The second, which perhaps is even less well understood, in fact, I would say despite a lot of evidence from the last 40 years, is that the forces that would lead from technological advances to shared prosperity are more conditional and more nuanced than often presumed. And here, to explain this, let me try to very quickly summarize a very simplistic econ economist take on why you might be justified in techno-optimism. And it would go something like this. Technological advances, when they are indeed advances, when they are indeed progress, would expand our capabilities to do many things, including productivity. And so that increases average productivity, meaning how much we produce uh, given the number of workers or given the number of resources we have. And this higher average productivity would naturally lead to higher wages because with more productive labor, employers would go and try to hire more workers and that would lead to wages being bid up. And that's great because most of us earn our livings as workers and if wages increase, that creates a powerful set of forces towards shared prosperity. <laughs> so the catch in this story is that for wages to increase and for employers being willing to go out and hire more labor, it isn't sufficient or even isn't so critical that average productivity increases. What employers are interested in is what workers contribute to the production process or what economists would call marginal productivity. So the presumption that somehow technological advances will lead to better, higher wages, more opportunities, more employment, uh, options for workers is predicated on some sort of belief that average and marginal productivity would move together. But there is no economic law that they have to do so. And in fact, for a very important set of technologies, what we would call automation, meaning technologies where machines or algorithms are substituted for what humans used to perform before, there are good reasons for thinking that average productivity will increase. We're producing the same amount or more with fewer workers. But the forces that would increase marginal productivity are not so great. What would happen is that labor becomes less essential for production, and employers might say, let's just go on producing more with capital, with algorithms. That would benefit entrepreneurs, capital owners, managers, but not necessarily the majority of the workers, and the foundations of shared prosperity wouldn't be so strong. Automation has been with us since at least the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and it will continue to be with us. There is nothing wrong with automation. There are many tasks that humans used to perform that used to be dangerous, onerous, not so much fun, that have been automated, good riddance. But the problem becomes when automation becomes the only or the main focus of technological change, because then what are humans there to do? And our read of history, as well as a lot of empirical and theoretical work that I have done in this area, suggests that for shared prosperity, you need automation to be accompanied with other technological changes that reinstate labor centrally into the production process. New tasks for labor, new productivities, new ways for labor to make better decisions, more problem solving. But if we go down the automation path, there is no guarantee that shared prosperity will result. Now, what both of these concerns highlight is a more general point. Who controls information? Who benefits from better information? Whose central role is being intensified and whose role is being sidelined by new production technologies? These are just some of the facets of a broader set of choices. Technology, the application of scientific and practical knowledge to production and other domains of our lives is extremely flexible, extremely malleable. We have many consequential choices and my discussion of control of information and automation and new tasks was meant to highlight that there are many different directions in which we can go. If we choose the right directions, we are much more likely to build the foundations of shared prosperity. And part of the reason why 
we wrote the book and we think this is a critical period and the critical period in which we should be concerned is because those choices are very real and there are good reasons for being worried that we are, we have been making the wrong choices and we are at the cusp of perhaps repeating and intensifying those wrong choices. And in particular, what we argue in the book is that there are structural reasons coming some from corporate America's priorities and strategies and some from the tech world that have pushed us towards too much automation and too much centralized control of information, monitoring, surveillance, and sidelining of many workers and citizens. These come partly, not entirely, but partly from a focus on cost cutting and trying to make labor more easy to manage in large corporations. That creates tools for automation and tools for monitoring that the tech industry has been very willing to su supply because it's been very profitable. But it also comes, we argue, from the tech industry's own internal structure and perhaps its ideological uh, focus on things like autonomous machine intelligence, artificial general intelligence, or the general emphasis on trying to empower the designers, the top engineers, the top managers at the expense of the line workers and the majority of the other people, whereas there are different ways for managers to approach their corporations. For example, rather than just cost cutting, trying to make your workers more productive, provide them the tools, the training for doing so. And there is a track record actually that has in the past sometimes worked very productively of emphasizing not machine intelligence, but what Simon and I call machine usefulness, make machines useful to humans, useful to workers, rather than a tool for sidelining them. But those, what we would view as socially more beneficial pathways are not the ones that we are on right now, and that is the reason why we think this is a critical period. Thanks, Duran. You, you, you talk about um, the fact that just because you have technological um, innovation does not guarantee shared prosperity. And one uh, way to give an example for that is to look at the last 75 years post-World War period. In the first half of that period until around 1980, we obviously have technological progress, but we do see uh, shared prosperity, at least in the US and other advanced countries of the world. And then something changes. Then we don't see it. We, you know, we have a rise in inequality and even a relative fall in productivity uh, growth. In, in, in your view, what is different in these two periods when we have shared prosperity and when we don't? What, what changes and can we learn something from it that tells us something about where we should go going forward? Well, thank you, Atif. That's a really central question. And, and I think what makes the period that you are uh, pointing to so interesting, and in fact, you can draw similar lessons if you go further back in history from the long durée of the Industrial Revolution in Britain and then in the rest of Europe, is that they contradict two types of simple and extreme interpretations. One that says the market system can never generate shared prosperity, and we've seen shared prosperity emerge in the second half of the 19th century to some extent in Britain in the United States and continuing and then intensifying in the three decades that followed World War II. And it also, of course, contradicts those that say that there are these inexorable forces that are going to create benefits for workers of all skill groups because we see, for instance, in the first phase of the Industrial Revolution and even more sharply during what happened during the last 40 years in the United States, technological progress, new technologies, new tools, new organizational forms, and productivity growth can go hand in hand with much, much higher levels of inequality and even worse, a complete undermining of the shared prosperity system because real wages for many demographic groups, for example, low education workers, workers with high, high school education or less, uh, or even those with associate degrees and community college degrees actually declining quite steeply while other groups were making much more money and productivity was increasing, capital owners were doing well, managers were doing very well. So there was a decoupling from about half of the uh, uh, population's prosperity from what was going on with the aggregate economy and the well-off people. So those examples tell us that there is no natural law of 
economics that either we're always going to generate inequality or we're going to have very powerful forces for shared prosperity all the time, but they emphasize the choices that we have to make about institutions, about the direction of technology, and that's where our sort of book comes in. So the, the question is, why did the shared prosperity model of uh, the 50s, 60s, and early 70s break down sometime around 1980. And in a nutshell, our interpretation is that the balance of technology went much more towards automation and much less towards pro-worker, human complementary technologies, such as those that created new tasks and better capabilities for workers. And at the same time, the institutional balance that created some way for workers to share in the benefits, such as worker voice in workplaces and regulation that kept uh, the largest very powerful corporations in check weakened. So both the institutional foundations and the technological foundations of shared prosperity weakened, undermining the sort of uh, earlier experience. Do you have a take on what came first, the technological shift or the political institutional shift? That's a great question. I actually think that the two were self-reinforcing, but one is not the original sin. So in terms of quantitative importance, my work suggests that the technological changes were more important, but the technological changes themselves were embedded in the institutional changes that furthered them and did not create a counterbalance. And if you look at the history, the institutional changes start you know, as early as the New Deal. So as early as the New Deals try to create a different type of uh, industrial relations and control over large corporations, there was a backlash against it. And then that sort of gained momentum in the 50s, 60s, and finally in the 1970s. You know, Ronald Reagan says, uh, you know, I'm here today when he was elected because of all of the advances that Goldwater make. Uh, and, and so this was sort of a, a process that, that, go, that went back. But also you see managers trying to be extremely enthusiastic in like early versions of numerically controlled machinery in the 1950s and there are business publications that are promising workerless factories as early as 1952. So this sort of desire among some corporate leaders of oh, we can cut costs, we can get rid of labor, especially troublesome labor, that was there. So the two sort of got intensified in the 1980s. You mentioned uh, the need for redirecting technology, and, and, and one way in which you framed it uh, was by making it more useful for labor, uh, that it complements labor more than, than not. Um, that's understandable, but why not another solution which might be let the capitalists do whatever they want, and we'll just go and tax them and give people basic income or whatever the model might be? Wow, great question. And uh, there are many objections to what I'm suggesting, well, perhaps we can come back to many of them. One is, it's not feasible, it's not technically feasible. You know, some build, people believe that automation is inevitable. And who anything. decides? Who gonna, decides? Gonna come and to second, that. even if it were feasible, you cannot redirect technological change, so we have counter arguments against those. But the one that you raise is a very common criticism, which is why even try, even if it's feasible, even if it, we can do it by redirecting technological change, why not let just continue along this path, but improve the social safety net, for example, more redistribution, uh, perhaps a universal basic income, and that's the way to create post-tax shared prosperity. And I think I have three basic objections to that. The first one is that I don't think it's feasible, meaning that the political economy of it doesn't work out. You know, today already you have you know, amazingly powerful, very rich individuals who are not so keen in, in paying, you know, even 15% tax rate on their incomes to think that the political economy is going to line up so that they're going to be willing to pay 90% of their income to create better living standards for many people. I think that's not politically feasible, even if they promise it, it won't work out. Second, I think even if it worked out, it would be a very dystopian society because what we care about is not just and should not be just income. It's not like consumption is the only thing we care about. I think social status, social worth, what people are viewed to contribute to society are equally important. And it would be a very sad society in which we thought that 5% of people create everything and the rest are takers that will live off the crumbs. And that would create such a hierarchical, such a two-tier society that it would be much worse than the unequal society that we live in. And then the third is that, you know, 
I think UBI and those kind of schemes are defeatist. They rule out other more uh, proactive solutions like creating better jobs, more meaningful jobs, more meaningful democratic pathways for citizens. So I think it's like throwing the towel. So for all of these reasons, I don't think uh, I am comfortable supporting these solutions. Now, of course, if I turn out to be wrong and uh, that all these other things are not feasible, at the end, we are heading uh, inexorably and inevitably to a world in which Mark Zuckerberg, Sam Altman, and Elon Musk are going to own everything, sure, then at that point I'll sign up for UBI, but we're not there yet. So, Daron, how do we redirect technology? Is the answer in some appropriate tax on technology that is too capital intensive? I mean, how, how should, who decides what to do and how should it be done? So, the way that we try to structure that discussion in the book is through a three-step process. I think the first step, and we hope our book is a minor, small contribution to that, is to change the narrative. So as long as the narrative is either about techno-optimism or killer robots or about geniuses who are going to bring a better future, I think those questions about the direction of technology and how that direction of technology is so important for inequality, for democracy, those things cannot be had. So I think we first need to change the narrative and have the conversation more about what type of technologies we want and understanding uh, better, trying to understand better their downstream effects, what they will imply for good jobs, what they will imply for inequality, for wages, for democracy, uh, for civil society. Once we start having that conversation, then the second step will be, well, fine, it's good to have a conversation, but that conversation won't turn into a reality unless there's an institutional basis for it. So that's where creating countervailing powers comes in. So what was so important in the institutional take that I gave briefly about the 1950s and 1960s in response to your earlier question is that during that period, there was labor voice in workplaces that was important for wage wages, for working conditions, sometimes even for technology choices, and there was regulation. So uh, Ralph Nader, before he was a third party candidate, he was the symbol of a civil society movement about keeping large companies accountable. So that regulation wasn't just a civil society thing, there was a lot of regulatory capital within the government sector that was about making sure that large corporations did not act like monopolies, did not violate antitrust, did not uh, mislead consumers, and so on. So that sort of countervailing power needs to come. That's not an easy step because the labor movement in its old form I don't think is right for the age of AI, so we need a new labor movement and there are actually laws in the books in the United States that make more productive labor unions, labor organizations very difficult. There's a history in the United States that is very conflictual between capital and management, sorry, management and workers that's going to make that very difficult, so it's not an easy step, but some sort of that countervailing powers need to develop. And then within that uh, context, we need to talk about specific policies. And I think those specific policies, we don't know them exactly what they should, we don't know exactly what they should be because we haven't studied them as a, as a profession, as policymakers. But there are some uh, basic principles that we can talk about. No, I don't think we are at the point where we should be talking about automation taxes yet because I actually our existing tax system already subsidizes capital at the expense of labor. So creating a more balanced tax system without going to robot taxes or anything, I think would already be a very important step. So if you are a business today and you think of hiring workers, you and the workers jointly would pay something like 30%, 25 to 30% tax. If instead you hire capital to do exactly the same task, you would pay something less than 5%. So that means a very powerful motive for using automation and capital rather than workers. So creating a more equal tax system where marginal tax rates are equated between capital and labor would be one major step rather than robot taxes. Second, in the future, uh, a major part of distribution and also the nature of technology is gonna depend on data who controls data, how you use data, who, who do you compensate data. So I think we need to find ways of creating a market structure that, uh, that provides fair and efficient compensation for data, both because of it as a distributional step, but also actually to encourage better use of better development of these technologies. Because when you expropriate data, that also creates uh, 
disincentives for generating high quality data. Those were some of the issues that were actually at the center of the WGA strike that uh, just, just concluded in Hollywood. So I think we need some sort of new structure for data economy. I don't think that will be individual data ownership, so you probably need some sort of collective data ownership within that context. We also need new business models uh, because part of the reason why, for instance, the way that monopolization of information is, is, is working out is how information is being collected and how it's being monetized. If information monetization creates a lot of uh, negative effects, that's actually not going to lead to the development of the right type of technologies, either from the point of view of democracy or from the point of view of workers. But worse, those business systems are going to become self-reinforcing. Today, for example, it's very difficult to create a social media platform that's not monetized on the basis of individual digital ads. So if we need new ideas to come, we need to create space for these things. And finally, I think, yes, <clears throat> we also need to find ways of subsidizing uh, more pro-worker, pro-democracy uh, uh, developments of uh, new technologies, digital technologies. That's not an easy thing because uh, there's a lot of uh, measurement problems. What is pro-worker? What is anti-worker? What is automation? What is new task? But in other domains, we've seen that it works. So for example, in the area of energy, you know, the narrative changed from we need more and more energy to one where people started recognizing that you know, carbon emissions are problematic. Then <coughs> there were countervailing powers, regulations, for example, starting in California and at the state level, civil society action, and then finally, around the world, some carbon prices and in the United States, subsidies to green energy, and it led to a complete redirection of technological change. If you look at both patents towards renewables, they shoot up. The efficiency of renewables, they shoot up. So they show that even a modicum of intervention or along the lines of what I suggest could actually be a powerful tool for, towards redirection. <coughs> you, you mentioned uh, <coughs> data, and, 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 and that's sort of a new element of this next wave of technological change, that data has become a lot more important than it used to be. Uh, and perhaps some of our um, old uh, mechanisms of defining property rights and so on are not built to deal with this issue of who owns data and, 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 and who controls data and all of that. Um, all of us generate the data, but we don't own it. Somebody else tends to own it, whoever owns the platform. So it's a big question, and it's an important one with uh, sort of uh, important policy issues and questions of how we should go about handling data and defining the ownership of data. Do you have any specific uh, proposal or ideas in terms of how yeah. to deal with this issue? So I think you're 100% right, and there's many, it's a multifaceted problem. I think we do need some sort of interoperability so that people are able to take their data, for example, uh, in the social media context, but I think that's, the, that's not the most important problem. The most important problem is, <coughs> how you can use data, who, you, who can use data, and when data creates a comparative advantage or competitive advantage. And I think, just to understand some of the issues that are here, let's think about, before I talk about you know, uh, some specific ideas, let's, let's understand the issue a little bit more, and think about you know, ChatGPT or other large language models there will be some disagreement about how much wisdom there is in these models, but there is some wisdom and some knowledge. But if you look at where it's coming from, what I believe and what some experts believe is a lot of it is coming from a few repositories such as Wikipedia, where there is very well curated, very well organized, quite reliable information. But who gave the permission to OpenAI to take all of that information from Wikipedia? Certainly the Wikipedia Foundation did not. Certainly the people who spent endless hours to contribute to Wikipedia for that collective knowledge did not. So that was expropriated. Was that fair? And once you do it that way, what does it mean for future creative data? So another big repository where GPT-4 has hugely benefited from is uh, Stack Overflow. So GPT-4 is very good at simple programming routines. P people are impressed. Where that comes from, I think 99% of it comes from Stack Overflow, which is extremely well curated. People ask questions, how do I write this routine? Um, how do I debug this problem? And then uh, many experts give answers. Those are voted up or down, and they're very nicely. So this, uh, it's not a secret that GPT-4 was heavily trained on Stack Overflow. But as soon as GPT-4 is introduced, and there is no compensation for people on Stack Overflow again, what happens is that you see that the, the amount of traffic in Stack Overflow 
this, uh, this uh, gets destroyed. The same thing could happen to Wikipedia. Wikipedia, the whole project of Wikipedia could be destroyed by these large language models. So when that happens, you're actually chasing the good data and you're gonna be, end up with the bad data from Reddit or you know, from more you know, uh, uh, ideological or unreliable uh, data, data platforms. So it's both a uh, question of distribution, who gets compensated, it's a question of privacy and regulation. You know, this is a wild west, whoever grabs the data has an advantage, that's a problem. It's also one of productivity and future of the technology, that this technology could be digging its own grave. So all of these makes me think that we need to have some regulation on how you use data. But I don't think it's the government that's gonna, should be deciding, yeah, you can use Atif's data, but not, you cannot use Ernest's data. So I think a market mechanism would be better. But the problem is that with data, I think the standard market pricing system wouldn't work. It wouldn't work because if you take my data, that's very substitutable to your data. I identify cats very similarly to you. That makes your data very, very much less valuable. It's very less valuable to the platform. It's less valuable to you. So that creates a race to the bottom. So if platforms deal with individual customers, individual data providers as, as the unit, then the data externalities and the substitutability of data is going to push prices to, towards very, very low levels to zero, and then again going to be all this abundant data that can be used in, in, without any limits. So what that suggests is that we need market prices, but that mar those market prices need to be div uh, supported by some sort of collective data ownership. So one idea, for example, due to computer scientist uh, Jerome Lanier is data unions, where just like WGA has a union, data providers have to have unions. Interesting. Uh there's a thread in the, in, in, in the book and your conversation today, which is that markets or market incentives can be too much uh, from a social perspective, and you need to rein in markets. Even in this example, you can, you can see that, that if there's, a, if, if, if there's a fight for eyeballs, that will let platforms do all crazy things just to gain attention and so on. Um, now, the implications of that run much deeper, actually, uh, because more information does not mean more good information. And <clears throat> it can go to a level where there's a general breakdown of trust, where you don't know what is true, what is false, and we all just go back into our own cocoons and silos. Um, it's a very basic, it's a very big problem. How does one deal with this fundamental problem that if you let markets, which is how we are used to dealing with exchange of ideas and, 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 and goods and services, that markets themselves are not helpful and they in fact might be uh, counterproductive. So how do we rein those in? Well, I think I would, I would say that in all of these areas we need to have a slightly more nuanced perspective. In fact, we may need to have two at first apparently contradictory ideas in our minds at the same time. So for example, on technology. How can you say technology has not been good? We are amazingly fortunate to be living in the beginning of the 21st century when we are hugely more prosperous, comfortable, healthier than people who lived 300 years ago. And all of those benefits have technological roots. That's true, but that doesn't mean that there was an inexorable automatic process from technological advances to these things. So that's the conditional nature that I was trying to emphasize. The same thing with markets. I am convinced that markets are a critical part of the resource allocation process, especially in innovation. And again, we owe a lot of these advances in technology to the market process that has been a central part of the innovation process. But that doesn't mean that markets will always work and that markets will work without regulation. In fact, you know, sometimes Theorems or you know, uh, claims are sort of thrown around that economics shows markets are the right way to allocate innovative resources. That's not true. Economics, I think, shows a lot of evidence that if you sideline markets completely, that's going to be terrible. The Soviet Union is not a good model for innovation. But economics is also full of ideas for why the innovative forces are not going to be always well calibrated. 
there may be too much incentives for innovation. Worse, my emphasis, the direction of innovation is not going to be right. You can have the wrong kind of you know, competition. You know, if you, for example, are competing for something like the, uh, the, the digital technologies or AI, where ex post, because of network economies or monopoly over data, you're going to have a lot of profits, a lot of rents. You're going to get a lot of ex ante competition, but it's going to be the wasteful kind of competition, and it won't do anything for the ex post control of that technology. So the market process by itself is essential for technological progress and the right kind of technological progress, but it's not sufficient. So that's why I think we need to have this debate, what type of technologies we want, and how can we shape that market process with the right regulatory regime. So yes, I think the United States during the 1950s and 60s and 70s was very innovative, and the market process was absolutely essential, but this was also embedded in a system in which there was support from the government, National Science Foundation, National Institute of, Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, sometimes in the form of procurement, sometimes in the form of setting the agenda, like in the Manhattan Project, or computers, or, uh, or nanotechnology, or aerospace. And also regulation played an important role that technology and innovation was not abusive. So I think that's the discussion that we need to have. But I am completely convinced that the market processes will remain essential for the right type of innovation in the future as well. So on the question of regulation or how to regulate markets, if you think of, if you take environment as an example, mm -hmm. um, at least some of the harmful effects are measurable and that's helpful because then you can make it part of regulation. You know, you can do carbon pricing, you can do things of that sort. Uh, one of the issues with uh, sort of information are, and, 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 and uh, sort of the negative externalities that you talked about is that it's, uh, while we, we know what we are talking about, it's, 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 it's hard to measure the, what is negative, what is bad uh, information. And uh, it's certainly hard to have a consensus on how to define what, what bad is. Um, and so maybe it might be a hopeless task to try to regulate this end of the, of the market? I won't deny that that's a difficulty. So in order to regulate something, you first need to measure it. You also need to have some sort of consensus, as you've pointed out. And there are difficulties, both, you know, what is pro-democracy versus anti-democracy way of providing, curating, exploiting information? What is, you know, worker complementary versus worker substituting? There is going to be some question mark on all of these things. And I don't deny that that's difficult. But I would like to point out that it took us a while to work out the right measurement framework for environmental uh, Purposes. So when Rachel Carson wrote, uh, you know, the Silent Spring, uh, many people were already aware of the tensions that industrialization and production would pose to the environment. But if you read that book, you're not going to come up with this is the measurement. These are the things that we need to tax. These are the things we need to subsidize. It took quite a while for understanding both the science of global warming and then after that, you know, measuring the carbon content. And you know, if we didn't make those investments, you wouldn't know what's the carbon content of steel production versus you know, uh, cars versus electric cars. And we still don't know what's the carbon content of electric cars, by the way, because their supply chain is so complicated. But it's the same thing. I think we have made progress in understanding what different types of technologies do. We can do much better work of measuring their impacts. And, and it won't be perfect, but uh, I think we can go towards a measurement framework. But there is another part of your question. What about consensus? Consensus is hard, and that's the sort of vicious circle here. The less well-functioning our democracy is, the more difficult it is to build consensus on anything, including important reforms. And without those important reforms, inequality increases. Uh, information becomes more monopolized. Information gets more abused. And that makes democracy function even less. So that is the vicious circle. But I'm not an optimist, but I'm hopeful. Daron, on your um, electric vehicle question, I, I, uh, an, an EV guy recently told me that the answer is 30,000 miles. <laughs> you, need, you, you need to drive your electric vehicle at least 30,000 miles before you become uh, carbon positive uh, in the right way. Um, people talk about AI in terms of its disruptive forces and you know, how intelligent it is or it might be. Do you have a take on whether some of the, in, the intelligence aspects of AI are maybe overblown? or How, how do you see the potential threats of AI on that, on that? Margin. Well, I have some views. I don't know whether people will share them. That's a different <laughs> question. Uh, first of all, yes, I think there's a lot of hype. So, uh, you know, ChatGPT became the fastest spreading technology in human history, I think. And, and that was the 
triumph of hype. But that doesn't mean that it's not an impressive technology. There are many aspects of it that's impressive, and many computer scientists that I know, and I myself would not have predicted three years ago that the technology would advance so quickly. That being said, I don't think what ChatGPT4 or other related large language models and generative AI tools display is true intelligence, and there's a lot of unreliability, brittle, brittle nature, fragility to these information. But more importantly, I don't even think that's the most interesting discussion. Once we put aside the fear that you know, within the next you know, several years, we are going to move towards some sort of super intelligent evil algorithm, which I think has zero probability, then the question becomes what we're gonna use these impressive tools for. And I think that's part of the That's good to reason, know, that's a positive. Yes, that's the positive, yes. that's the positive. Uh, and the reason you know, why I started uh, uh, my, my response to your first question that we are at a critical period is precisely because I think generative AI tools are impressive and there are very important questions about the direction of their development, the direction of their use, their architecture. To put it simply, many digital technologies before were promised as tools that would be helpful for humans. And in some ways they were, but their capabilities were not advanced enough to be useful across a number of very important domains. And today, I think with generative AI, we are moving to a situation where in theory, in principle, technically feasibly, these tools could be quite useful to many humans. So many people today are working at least in part in problem solving decision tasks. It's not just office workers, but even people who work with their hands, they have a series of problem solving tasks. And the problem, uh, the challenge for all of these problem tasks is to know what's the right information to bring. And we live in a world that is abundant in information and very, very scarce in useful information because we don't know how to match among that large, big body of knowledge which one is going to apply to our domain and do that in a very rapid way. So generative AI tools should be viewed as tools of information retrieval, filtration, and curation, meaning that you take the very vast information, you filter, you filter it given the specific application, and you curate it in a way that you can provide it to the human decision maker, and the human decision maker can then perform his or her tasks much better. So that is the promise. That is the promise that I think Microsoft is trying to capture when they call their uh, generative AI tools co-pilot. Human remains the pilot, the co-pilot is the machine that provides information. But <clears throat> I think most of the applications of generative AI, and this is where the history of the industry, the corporate incentives and tech incentives are coming in, that's not going in this direction. So the concern is that while generative AI technically has those capabilities, that's not where we're going. Where we are more likely to go is that generative AI is going to centralize information even more and it's gonna use that information for more individualized ad, more information manipulation, and in the workplaces for more monitoring, and a lot more automation. So it's not that it's gonna give you better advice on how to write and how to you do your research. It's gonna write the text for you. That may be a crappy text. That's what Pascual Restrepo and I call so-so automation. That's the worst. It automates, it sidelines you. You don't even get the productivity benefits. So I think in the age of generative AI, we're really at the danger of massive so-so automation because these technologies are not as good as they are hyped up to be, but they are good. So the question is, can we make them better and can we use them for the things that we really need them to be just to complement humans and make humans better decision makers in the workplaces and in the political sphere? That's the question. Jerome, I think you're the right person to ask this question. What, what is intelligence? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think uh, when people are talking of intelligence, they have in mind some generalized ability to solve diverse problems. And it is in this sense that humans are intelligent because we are extremely flexible, we're amazing decision makers, we are amazing problem solvers, we are hugely adaptable. Not all we, of us. Uh, mo most of us, most of us. I mean, I think this is actually the thing that I am so troubled by the ideology of the tech world because the ideology of the tech world has this view that most of us are not that intelligent. But actually, if you look at a person working as a carpenter, as a, 
as a gardener, as an electrician, I think the amount of intelligence problem solving, transferring information from one domain to another, the social interaction, the situational awareness, those are just amazing. And intelligence is that, and I don't think the machines are gonna have that. They're gonna be able to solve some very scripted problems. Alpha fold is great, alpha zero is great. They're gonna be able to do some curation of information, but they're not gonna have this sort of generalized problem solving, analogies, learning from one domain and generalizing to another for quite a long while. I don't think we're gonna see truly intelligent machines during my lifetime. I don't know whether they're gonna see them during my children's lifetime. But, but they're gonna make advances and that's why I think, again, the right question is not to be obsessed about machine intelligence, but how can we make these machines useful for us, which is what we call machine usefulness. So it's a good segue to ask sort of a, a, a question that parents worry about, which is, um, what should their children do in terms of, you know, what should they study? And children have different abilities. You know, some, if somebody's good at science and math, maybe it's obvious what they should do. But, you know, what if they are good in writing, they're good in art, they're good in, like, how, what, what do you have particular advice? Well, I, I, for thank different you. types of kids. Thank you. thank you for asking that question and prefacing it with this uh, diverse skills. I think that's very, very important. I think what's impressive about human capabilities is this diversity. You know, some of us are good at one thing, some of us are good at other things. There are multiple types of uh, skills and things that people bring. And the question is, how can we you know, harness all of them and also value all of them. So going back to, the, to my answer about UBI, I think it would be a sad world if we only valued one type of skill while humans are capable of doing very useful works. So in that context, I would say there are two things that I would, I would uh, emphasize in the context of what we should be doing ourselves to adapt to the age of AI. And I would certainly not say more education, more education, more education. Oh, education is great. We're in a great educational institution. We all love education. But I think economists' answer of the answer to every problem is more education. I'm not sure whether that's right. I think the right type of education is what we need. And I think the right type of education has two elements. One is social, which is we also need to become much more aware, much understand the ethical aspects of uh, these new technologies, our social responsibilities in the context of these technologies. So that's the social aspect. Perhaps each parent may not have the great incentives to do this as for their, their, their children, but I think as a community that's very important. I think part of the problem of the tech world is this impunity that the tech world granted itself and we granted them that they can be disruptive without having any social responsibility. And I think uh, the, the results of that have been disastrous. So hopefully the next generation of tech leaders won't have that and that will have to start from educational institutions. The second is I think we have to harness these diverse skills but also paying attention to what are the types of activities in which machines are going to be very good substitutes and what are the activities in which machines are going to be complementary. So if you are uh, super interested in being a low-level ad writer or uh, jingle writer or information summarizer, that's not a great career. I think you, would, you should think about something else. But there is a lot of evidence that some skills are in high demand. Employers are demanding a lot of social skills. So that's a very diverse set of occupations that people can be. And then if we actually uh, redirect technological change uh, in the age of AI, as I suggested, for better decision makers, I think a lot of problem solving tasks are going to be great places for humans. And as well, of course, if, if, if people want to be computer scientists, there's going to be great room for more designers of these, uh, of, these, of, these, of these technologies. But the general high level thing is, of course, a better awareness of what types of skills are going to be uh, in demand and what types of skills are going to be made, at least partially redundant by AI automating some tasks. Thanks, and just last question, and then we'll open up for audience questions. Uh, I want to just move, we're, we're, we're talking, I guess, implicitly about the US and advanced countries, uh, how to deal with these issues, but I want to have one question about development and uh, poor countries now. Um, if you are uh, Bangladesh, if you're Ghana, you know, you have this old, the, the Taiwan model of export-led growth, manufacturing, and so on. Will, does that work anymore? What should they do differently now if they're looking for growth? Uh, another great question. And, you know, economic development has been my passion and my main uh, 
topic, one of my main topics of research throughout my career. But this book squarely focuses on the US and the uh, technology frontier in the past, Britain and Europe, to some degree China today. And that's because you know, we wanted to focus on the direction of technology as it develops. But I think the direction of technology has huge implications for the developing world. And in fact, those are some of the ones that really need to be drawn out because I don't think many business leaders and policymakers in the developing world are really focusing on this question. First of all, every technology from the frontier then gets spread. So uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Turkey are going to ad adopt AI tools sometime soon. But second, even if they don't do that, the international division of labor is going to change because of AI as it has started changing because of robotics. And that means uh, the type of tasks and industries and sectors that those countries can gainfully specialize in is going to change. And I think the key question again is going to be the direction of technology. So in the same way that the question, what will AI do to inequality, doesn't have an answer. AI will do to inequality whatever we choose it to do to inequality. What will AI will mean for the developing world doesn't have a very clear answer because it will depend on how we choose AI to be directed in the future. So if AI goes in the direction of, say, the hopeful direction that I highlighted, that could be highly complementary to workers around the world. It could, be, uh, it could enable them to uh, perform tasks that require greater expertise. It could enable them to sell their services more fr freely and usefully around the, the global economy. It could enable greater specialization, better training of workers around uh, in the developing world. But if AI goes more and more in the automation direction, that I think could create a big problem for many middle-income countries because the comparative advantage of these middle-income countries and their abundant resources in middle-skill tasks and middle skill labor is abundant in those countries. And exactly like the South Korea, Taiwan, later China example, is how you leverage those you know, low skill, labor intensive tasks, and then you move up the value chains via exports. That path is gonna be much harder if there is much more automation based on digital technologies and AI. So, uh, so what should the developing world do? Well, hope for the right uh, direction of technology. But I think it's also very important for the developing world to have a voice in this, in the same way that I think not just the, aesthetic, uh, not just the optics, but the reality is really problematic when uh, US Senate has a hearing and only the uh, CEOs of the top tech companies are there, no labor voice is there. Another problem is there's no voice from the developing world. They're gonna be as of influence, so, so are the workers in the United States. So they need to develop a voice, they need to have a perspective on what they want from AI and how they can encourage the right type of technologies to be used. And of course, in the same way that we talked about individuals, individuals need to prepare themselves with their investments in education, with their investments in, 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 uh, in, in their human capital, same thing will probably apply to developing worlds, that if you're aware of where the technology is going, that's going to require some sort of adaptations in your strategy as well. <coughs> Thank you very much, Daron. We'll, we will now open up for uh, <coughs> questions from the audience. Um, if you can raise your hand, we'll collect questions. Hi, Daron. You talked about the impunity of the tech sector and how we're all supposed to just, you know, uh, sit by where they disrupt us. And it reminds me a little bit in some sense of how I was taught in grad school about how technology affects wages. We have this sort of technology that comes, you know, it is gonna affect demand for certain groups. T typically we think of it as skill biased in, in recent decades. And then maybe we compensate the losers. So I guess my question is sort of uh, two related questions. One, do we think the economics profession has some uh, responsibility for the way that we for our situation today where, you know, technology, as you, as te the tech sector, as you say, has this impunity. And two, is there a way that you would change, um, you know, how graduate economics or maybe undergraduate economics as well is taught to sort of better um, prepare us for the, you know, the challenges you talk about in the book? Well, thank you, Ileana. Those are fantastic questions. And uh, I think, yes, uh, <clears throat> I think the uh, economics profession, I think, is generally optimistic on technology, and there's, there are good reasons for that. You know, we learn from history, and again, as I said, the industrial, process, industrial revolution ultimately led to good outcomes. But if you look at the details, it didn't do so for 100 years. Much misery, poverty, inequality, lower wages. Uh, so 
that nuance adds to it. The other reason, again, from a theoretical point of view, we think of better technologies, expanding our production possibility set. That's good, but you know, how does that affect these distributions? So I think uh, there's already much more attention to these things in graduate school, I think, but we can pay more attention and a more nuanced understanding of these things would be useful. And I think creative destruction, I think, is, is actually a very interesting concept in there, so that you thank you for bringing that up. The, my take on that would be very similar to the take that I gave to Atif's wonderful question about the market. Creative destruction is a uh, inevitable part of the market process. And and we'll have to put up with it to some degree. But that doesn't mean that we should glorify it. Creative destruction as, you know, in some sense the tech industry reveled in being disruptive. And we also, perhaps as economists, would say creative destruction is great. But it depends on what you're destroying, it depends on what you're creating, and how, uh, how that compares to alternatives. So creative destruction has to be part of the market process, but it could be excessive, and I think that's what we have to recognize. <coughs> Thank you. Regulation is very jurisdictional. Um, <coughs> even, even labor unions have geographic or market scopes, but technology crosses borders. We see TikTok on military bases, and Facebook in Iran, and uh, AI everywhere. My question is, in a benign regulated technology state, if we achieve that here or in Europe, how does that exist in a multipolar world where the regulator uh, may not be benign? Uh, China and North Korea may actually be trying to regulate technology for their own surveillance or control. And so I guess my question is, in a multipolar world, can you talk about your thesis about having a thoughtful direction for technology, having other voices but in a world where technology is coming from multiple poles and where the checks and balances may be trying to go in the other direction, does the thesis presume a benign regulator? Thank you. That's an excellent question, and we live in a multipolar world, and we have to live with it, and China is going to push technologies in different directions. China has a very active AI sector. In many parts of it, they are behind, but one area where China has you know, made a lot of investments and seems to be <clears throat> on a par with any country is facial recognition and censorship tools and other monitoring technologies. Not only does China uh, produce these in great numbers, it also exports them. Huawei by itself, uh, according to reports, has exported these uh, monitoring uh, crowd control type technologies to more than 60 non-democratic countries. So that's going to have an effect on the direction of technology. And that is a curse. But the multipolarity multi could also be a blessing. You know, uh, the US has fallen behind in regulation, but the European Union has uh, been more ahead. And you can also learn, you know, the EU has made mistakes and you can learn from those mistakes. Uh, I think the special situation in the tech world, as in many other technologies, is that there's a lot more elbow room for regulation than m may first meet the eye. The same sort of concerns were raised, for example, in the context of carbon taxation and, uh, and support for renewable technologies. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, or to even 10 years ago, the argument was, you know, if we tax carbon, that's going to mean that it's going to create an advantage for India and China, and the same pollution is going to result, but it's just going to be those uh, countries doing the production. But what we saw is that actually once we started subsidizing renewables and the beginning of the transition, it's taking place in many countries because technology spread from one country to the other, there is some imitation process and so on and so forth. So in a good scenario, the same could happen in the right regulation of technology, but I don't think there is any guarantee that it will. Um, thank you, first of all, for coming all the way to Princeton. I wanted to ask um, about uh, what you have just asked, a bit of continuing about regulation. We have uh, talked about progress and how that can influence power, but I wanted to ask about how power can influence progress now. <coughs> And within that, whether there will be any Luddites that would oppose this creative destruction, as you have talked about because of the labor, um, labor uh, structures, right? And if there were, were to be so much automation, would there be, in the worst case scenario, some kind of protest where, I don't know, any labor unions or somebody would 
Yeah, I mean, I think, again, those are very important questions and very much relates to Ileana's excellent question about creative destruction. I think regulating, if you understand, what I, you understand from regulating technology is slowing it down or blocking it, that's much, much harder and not advisable. It's like trying to lead to sort of stop the flow of a river. That's just very, very hard. But I think the type of regulations that Simon and I are suggesting and the objective is not to stop the river, is not to stop creative destruction, but to redirect it towards somewhat more beneficial areas. And I think that's much more feasible, but it still depends exactly like you noted on social power. Who has social power? And by social power, what we mean isn't just like who controls the government. It's also who controls the agenda, who shapes the way that we think about uh, the issues or our aspirations. What are the costs and benefits? What are the acceptable damages? And I think the reason why the tech world has been so influential is not because they control tanks or weapons, is because they've set the agenda. And the idea that it's good to disrupt. Uh, it's good so many, many, many shops go under and one single platform emerges that dominates everything. That's good because it's disruptive. That is a particular way of viewing the world, and that's where social power is. So that's why we think that social power needs to come into this issue of redirecting technological change in a central manner. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for coming. So um, pretty much I'm looking at the fractional reserve system and its relation to technology. Technology <coughs> seems deflationary. Of course, fractional reserve system is inflationary. Um, are we looking at the six? Uh, are we looking at the situation um, in the wrong way? Are we correcting excesses in the economy? Um, have you looked at other systems besides, you know, fractional reserve as, uh, you know, it's in its relation to technology, and you know, just to see if it has some type of better relationship? Because, I mean, we might just be looking at it the wrong way. Tech might just be saving us in some form that, you know, we might not like because we've gotten out of hand. But, uh, you know, have you seen any ones that work correctly with technology in your study? Thank you for your question. Uh, those are interesting questions, but I have not studied them. So the issue of the relationship between technology and the monetary system, I think there's much more to be done. There's already some uh, interesting work that we discussed briefly about, for example, uh, <clears throat> how uh, electronic money uh, was introduced, and that was one of the ways in which actually it was a fairly human complementary type of technology, we would say, because it enabled a lot of tasks that were previously not possible, provided better information to decision makers across, uh, across the developing world when they didn't have access to it, but the broader issues you raise, I have not seen them. Uh, hi, I uh, already read the book. It's absolutely Thank you. brilliant. <laughs> I highly recommend it. Um, so yeah, my, my question, I think that the most powerful argument is the one on the impact of automation, negative impact of automation on the marginal productivity of, of labor. Uh, do, do you think, because you mentioned, I think, a bunch of those examples of how this led to firings, especially since the 80s, an impact on inequality, et cetera. Do you think that um, we should, as, as kind of a, you know, changing the narrative, the civil society way of, of, of doing these changes would be through uh, de-emphasizing the impacts of quarterly earnings reports, for example, for companies, right? So, because this is something that fosters short-term thinking, obviously. It would come as a cost of, you know, greater, lesser transparency, obviously, but would that be one potential avenue of, of thinking about the solutions? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. So, uh, let me step back and say, what I think is part of the problem, and then we can talk about how the quarterly earnings or other short-termist interest incentives feed into that. Uh, I think there are twin and related problems in corporate boardrooms. One is that labor has come to be seen mostly as a cost to be avoided, which creates a strong incentive to cut labor costs, either by not 
sharing the benefits via wage increases. You see that a lot in many modern corporations in the United States. And even more powerfully through automation, you have less labor, you have less labor costs. That is then coupled with the idea that, you know, perhaps does not originate with him, but it's often associated with powerfully argued by Milton Friedman that the only social responsibility of business is to increase shareholder value. Therefore, it's all fair game if you don't give any raises, don't create a good work environment where uh, benefits are shared and when you easily cut labor and so on. These two are synergistic and they are supported by a bunch of other organizations or by, by other uh, arrangements. I think short-term incentives are very much part of it. So short-termist pressures make it more likely that managers are going to focus on cost savings because that's an easy way of increasing shareholder value. It is also supported by the fact that you don't have labor voice. If you had labor voice, then it wouldn't be a practical to say that the only thing that the management should care about is shareholder value because there are thousands of workers in the organization. What about them? And of course, regulation. What about the environment? What about the community? So again, there was a point that Milton Friedman had, which is you don't want to create a very uh, uh, discretionary environment where it's not clear what the managers are doing, but that doesn't mean that the only thing that we should motivate the managers to do is just give as high returns to shareholders as possible. And I think a better path of technology would both be helped by, but also would create the tools for managers viewing workers as key resources. If workers are the key resources, that's the, they're the pathways via which your organization creates value, then you have all the more reason to invest in their productivity, train them, give them better tools, give them better information, treat them better so that you create a more long-term relationship with the workers. And I think that would be uh, conducive to a better corporate America. We are almost out of time, but we'll squeeze in one last question. Two. Okay, so um, uh, there are two things. One is that um, in the book you mentioned that Henry Ford um, understood that profit sharing is better for the economy, but there is substantial economic literature that shows that Ford just paid efficiency wages. Like if you look at what is the wage that would maximize productivity, he just paid that. So mm -hmm. my question, like the first one is, why don't we just trust that modern corporations will also arrive at the same conclusion and end up paying efficiency wages. The second thing is there is some contradiction between some, like in the book, there is a lot of talk about the regulatory environment in Europe and how that has led to uh, less inequality there. But on, other, on many other measures, the European economy is doing much worse than the American economy. And even more importantly, there is another paper that you, you co-authored that was about who makes the technology and who imports it. And in, in your paper, you kind of made the argument that uh, the United States makes a lot of the technology and many of the Scandinavian countries are kind of free riders on this. So, you know, if we do have similar regulatory environment to them, then maybe we're drying up this. Thank you. Uh, Should we get the last question and then okay. we can ask for them? Perfect. Yes. Um, yes. First of all, thank you so much for being here and this great discussion. Uh, I was wondering how you felt about AI alignment and the current mitigative um, slash like regulatory um, uh, movements that are in AI, or like licensing, for example, people who have already produced information that ChatGPT or AI art even uses. And how does that be, um, go into what the vision you have for future measures? I think that's an excellent question. And uh, I think there are two ways of conceptualizing AI alignment, a narrow and a broad one. The narrow one is the, is, is becomes much more like, what is the way of aligning AI with the long-term survival objectives? And it focuses on this issue of, you know, are you going to have super intelligent machines? And if they are super intelligent, will they kill us or will they let us live? I think that's secondary and unimportant. But the broad AI alignment is all about whether the technology is aligned 
with what we want from technology, which may be more shared prosperity, which may be better citizenry, which may be greater safety. And I think that's a very important discussion. But that being said, I would still not have chosen the word AI alignment as the term. And the reason for that is that that makes it sound like it's an engineering problem, whereas it's much more of a social problem. AI alignment is about alignment of the market structure and the companies that are designing AI and so on. So, and I think that social context really matters. But if at the end we use the word AI alignment and we focus on the right thing, I'm very happy. So in terms of your question, uh, you know, Ford was a leader in automation and a leader in introducing new tasks and a leader in efficiency wages. And, but he was a very contradictory figure himself. For example, he was very much uh, uh, about controlling workers as well and uh, was very anti-union. And, and the quote that you're referring to where we say, actually, the fact that we're paying high wages is good for the economy, uh, is doesn't come from Ford. We, uh, we, it's from uh, Magnus, uh, what's his last name? I forget. It was an engineer at Ford, but it's not Ford himself. Ford himself, when he defended the efficiency wage system, was very much on, sorry, with the higher, the $5 wage uh, the, the day, he was very much about you know, why this is good for reducing absenteeism, why it's good for making workers more motivated. But the, the more remarkable thing about Ford is that he somehow stumbled onto this way of using technology for simultaneously automating and also creating a lot of new tasks and new human functionalities. He wasn't alone in this. There were many other sectors that were doing that, but the Ford factory became emblematic for that. And in terms of you know, the international spillovers, yes, you're absolutely right. I think uh, in what we have pointed out in the earlier uh, paper is that <clears throat> when different countries adopt different strategies, that is going to have spillover effects. And, uh, and the more unequal system in the United States may sometimes lead to faster innovation out of which uh, you know, the more social welfare systems uh, in Europe may benefit from. But what that paper, you know, written more than 15 years ago, was ignoring was the direction of technology. So when it comes to the direction of technology, I think there are new issues, and those are the ones that we are emphasizing in this context. So if the U.S. is pushing very hard on the right levers, that's great for Europe, but if the U.S. is pushing very hard on the wrong levers, the wrong type of technologies that then would spread to Europe, to developing countries, and to China, and so on. But in that context, then, you know, again, there are these international interactions between the regulatory systems. Now, in the context that I responded to the, an earlier question, Europe is also trying to regulate the tech giants, and this is not a, uh, a, an empty threat because the European market is so big that they actually change their, how they use their technology, how they design their technologies in an important way. So I think there are these international interactions that are very interesting and much in need of greater study. So thank you for raising those issues. Thank you, Daron. To close our session, I'm going to turn the mic back to Professor Ramaswamy. Thank everyone. Uh, particularly thank uh, Professor Achevalu and Professor Adif Mian for this excellent conversation and the audience for coming here in such numbers. So uh, thank you, everyone. And please uh, uh, keep abreast of the Princeton Public Lectures website. And our next uh, uh, speaker is going to be uh, Atul, uh, Dr. Atul Gawande. Um, who's going to be talking about global public health. So have a wonderful evening, and thank you again. Thank you.